How many people have actually taken a look at the, it's called the new normal by Nick Kuyper? We got one, not many of you. So I'm gonna show a very short clip from uh, Nick's uh, film. He actually put it on during that first year that we were back um, from, from the pandemic. And it goes through a lot of uh, information, but this actually kind of shows you just a glimpse of what we've been doing with the wastewater. And then we'll go into detail, but um, I encourage you all to go look for that. So I don't know how to do this, like from Use the track pad. Yeah, just, click on, just that on that one, one there. Um, it did not go. I don't know if that's being shared with the screen though. Huh, how do I, because I can't click on this side, right? The connection doesn't work. Just undo it. Go back to here. Is it because we're not? Oh, sorry. sorry. Are we because we're not clicking on the main page? Let's see. Just take it, take it out of a viewer, and then take it out of this viewer thing. Yeah, to escape out of that, and then look at it, maybe, and then click from here. Sure. Huh. It worked perfectly fine before. If it doesn't work, that's fine. Writing is not that easy. Grammarly can help. This sentence is grammatically correct. First form is just pop on third Let me just make sure you're sharing. Okay. Oh, we're awesome. Oh, we're Okay. Yeah. We're gonna stop it. Okay. I will. <laughs> and we're off. Why'd you choose Ferris? I think Ferris chose me. <laughs> I had a brother that went to college here and visited it when I was I was younger. Spent a couple of weeks here and beautiful place in the world. I think we started it pretty much when COVID started. Gotta get that important part in there. I know what's in that hole. It's opening manholes. And 
pulling the, the sampling machines out and then uh, changing out the machines, changing batteries, and then uh, resetting for the next next day. To me, it's revolutionary that they can test that through their sewer samples. You know, I'm not sure on the sciencey part of it, but you know, this is my part to, to get them to where they're going, and it's just a great thing. It can only be a good thing, you know, get it under control and get our life back to where it should be. I think we're all, all waiting for that day. It still kind of baffles me to know that I'm a part of something so large. Nowhere else is doing what we're doing. This room up here is the COVID lab where we do like all of our processing of the samples. This part takes about three hours from start to finishing the stirring. Once we put it in the centrifuges, that itself takes an hour and a half. We go from having proteins and basically everything that's in that wastewater in our sample, and we run it through a membrane that just takes off the RNA. So then we're just looking at specifically RNA. August 19th, um, I was notified. So it does continue on and talks a, a little bit more about what we're doing, um, but I think you'll get a, a picture Sorry. of um, what we're doing. I thought I heard someone else talking. <laughs> um, and so I think what it highlights there is that every person I think that's involved with this feels like they're a small part of something really, really big, right? Um, so even I would say Dr. Sky Pike is the one that, that's really the person that's kind of, the person that's really involved with this, works on, works with all the students. People, he will say all the students are the ones that are doing it. All the students feel that, right? So everybody feels like everybody else is doing something. And we're one small part in the entire state. So let me just advance, maybe. Get this thing. Let's see if it's green. <laughs> and it wouldn't go forward when I push forward. What try mine? Okay. Next one. Okay, that'll work. All right. So kind of an overview of how this whole thing happened. Um, back in April, um, the pandemic, if you remember, started in March. Remember, it was spring break <laughs> at, for here at Ferris. And schools were deciding, should they come up? Blah, blah, bam, everyone goes online, right? Between April and September, some sites began voluntarily collecting samples for wastewater to start looking at the SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater. Ferris, and we started sampling back in August. So right before school started. And we sampled not only on campus, but we also sampled in the Big Rapids community. So we were targeting areas where students lived. Um, and so we were looking at the people that were coming back to campus from everywhere else. And we were looking to see, were we gonna be bringing back COVID into the community? Uh, between October 2020 and 15, the next year, there was a pilot study. So there was $10 million that was allocated to the state um, for this grant. And we actually backdated our work into there. So we were part of that back sites that were voluntarily collecting samples. Uh, there was a, a lag here. Actually, this changed. Anyway. Um, there was no funding, oh yeah, no funding from the state of Michigan, but we continued to sample. Next one. Um, so we continued to sample this entire time period. So we have gone continually since we started. Um, and then we had another grant that was a large grant that was put out. Um, it's called the Sewer Grant, um, Surveillance, <laughs> Wastewater, Environment, uh, I don't know all the words, right? Um, a large grant to continue to expand the SARS-CoV-2 and to 
surveillance in Michigan. And we expanded our testing sites to the entire district health department. Next slide. So if you look on the Michigan website, um, it started out with Michigan Eagle that was the primary um, overseer of the pilot grant. And then it actually moved into the Michigan Department of Human Health and Services. And these are all the testing sites. Um, what's not showing is how many are actually buried under a lot of these little dots. So there's over 400 testing sites that are being tested across our state. Um, we meet weekly to actually discuss what we're doing across the state. So 34 local health departments, uh, five Native American tribal nations, 18 public private academic laboratories. Essentially all of the universities except for two in the state are involved with this. And you can see that there are a number of places that we're looking and we're targeting certain areas where people congregate in tight living quarters where you're gonna be spreading disease. So we are in Macosta County and this is District Health 10. And so the district health and the little dots that you can see, those are the cities that we are targeting. And we are showing you the various number of sampling sites that we're targeting in each of those cities. Because Reed City is so close and it's right on our, our way going north, um, we are actually doing Reed City as well. Um, and then we report that information and we work with the, the health district for the Central Michigan District um, as well. All right. So to kind of give you an idea of what was happening at Ferris, right at the time when we started to get involved with the wastewater, um, this was after that first wave had hit. So back in March in the summer, um, Michigan was hit really hard. There were a lot of people that lost lives. Um, a lot of the larger universities were deciding to move online for fall semester. Ferris, um, if you weren't here at the time, <laughs> they were scrambling to put together social distancing in every single classroom. We were rescheduling all classes, things were moving on hybrid, they were going in person. And I would say anybody that was involved with any of the kind of organizational stuff, we were scrambling really fast, like all summer. It just seemed like everything was COVID. By late August, the case numbers were starting to rise. I don't remember if you remember New York was starting to, to skyrocket. And this, this little blip here was small by comparison. Um, and we were expecting cases to rise steeply here and everybody was coming back to campus. <laughs> well, not everybody, right? It was a mixture, but there was a large number of people that were coming back to campus. So how did we get involved? So the week, prior to welcome back week. And for students, that would be the week before classes start. <laughs> That's when faculty come back. On Monday of that week, Sky had been, he's involved with a with Michigan Eagle looking at each water consortium. So they look at E. coli testing. And you can talk about that if you want. Um, they reached out to um, the Michigan Eagle consortium and they said, we are gonna get all this money from the state and we're thinking about looking at wastewater for COVID. Do you wanna get involved? So he reached out to the district health department number 10. He reached out to me. And on Tuesday, we set a meeting for that Thursday to meet and discuss logistics and so forth. On Wednesday morning, I received an email from my dean's office and it came through Jim Bachmeyer. He's the associate provost for finance division. Um, through Leonard, he reached out to Leonard Johnson, provost for academic affairs or associate provost. Leonard reached out to my dean's office and they said, do we know anybody on campus? Cause they had heard about it as well. And so it came to me and I, tons of emails. And so by Thursday, we had a huge, a huge meeting at a time when nobody was meeting in person. <laughs> we all met down in the Shimatsu. Most of you are familiar with the Shimatsu lab. We had administrative officials, Mark Eichenberg from Physical Plant. We might've had more people from Physical Plant. I think every safety officer, biological sciences, all three of us. City officials from Big Rapids City, um, the wastewater treatment manager, I'm sure I'm missing more. And we met for about an hour, maybe hour and a half. And we decided we're gonna do this. Ferris was gonna put up the money if we needed money. 
go for it now. And Friday, we took samples. So it was the fastest thing that I've ever seen in science work and say, we have this idea, bam, let's go do it. Start tomorrow. <laughs> so that's what happened. Next. So I help get the city involved because I like to hang around wastewater plants. I'm a microbiologist. So it's sort of in my wheelhouse. Um, wastewater has always been involved in public health. Back in the turn of the 20th century, wastewater first became kind of standardized in the US and brought a lot of infectious diseases into check. And by the 1970s, the government in, had the Clean Water Act, 1972, where the wastewater plants were not only involved in kind of beautifying the water and reducing the likelihood of getting infected, but now tracking pollutants and reducing pollution. We're now in the third era of wastewater as a science. And now we're using wastewater to monitor public health. The wastewater plants know everything that happens in town because everything ends up there in the end. So we can now use modern molecular techniques to detect pathogens in wastewater at a community level, not at an individual level, not at a building level because we're gathering from larger catchments, but we can detect at a community level what's going on. And while we can't necessarily say there are seven people with COVID in North Hall right now, we can say, hey, there seems to be a problem in this region of town. Things are getting worse. Maybe you should think about doing something about that. So it acts as sort of a early warning system, but it's not that granular, but temporarily it's useful. So we'll try the next one. So what is SARS-CoV-2? We're gonna be talking a little bit in the future slides about some of its genes. SARS-CoV-2 is a beta coronavirus. It's a virus, not alive. Viruses are pretty small. If you take one human hair, that's about 100 micrometers across. SARS is about 100 nanometers across. So you take one hair, you line up 1,000 viruses. It's the width of one of your hairs. That's about how small they are. It has a bunch of different proteins, about 29 proteins. Some of the main structural proteins you hear about, a lot about are the spike protein on the surface, which changes a lot over time, and envelope protein, the E protein, and a nucleocapsid that wraps up its genetic instructions. Viruses are really nothing but genes with some attitude, and the instructions are the attitude part. It's all wrapped up with this N protein, this nucleocapsid protein you'll hear about. So the N gene encodes for that packaging part. The SARS is largely a respiratory virus, but we have the ACE2 receptors throughout our body and our vasculature, in our digestive tract and other places. And even if it was just a, a respiratory virus, because of the mucociliary escalator, we bring the mucus from our lungs up and swallow it. So as we clear viruses, they'll pass through the GI tract. So we can actually detect even respiratory tract viruses in wastewater because we'll be shedding them even before you're symptomatic and sometimes long after you're symptomatic. You'll be shedding viruses as part of the infectious process. So we do in this project, is look for the genetic signal for some of the structural proteins, particularly the nucleocapsid protein, N1 and N2 are two different regions within that nucleocapsid N protein that are used to quantitate the amount of signal we see in wastewater. And the signal we see is gonna be related to the number of people infected and also how many viruses they're shedding at that particular time in the population. So wastewater makes a great way to get a community-wide signal of how an infection is proceeding. So when we get a wastewater sample in the little video, we saw our plumber, one of our plumbers, running around with one of these little R2D2 units. These are automated samplers. 
you can get two different kinds of samples with wastewater. You can just go out and get what we call a grab sample. You just take a bucket, grab some of the wastewater that's present, and you get a sample of that particular time point. What's in the wastewater is a product of who's using the wastewater system at that point in time. You might have 12 people who are infected, but they're in bed, not using the bathroom. They won't be shedding into our wastewater, so you'd miss them. With an auto sampler, which is what this little R2D2 unit is, it is a sampler that takes small samples periodically throughout the day. So it'll take 75 milliliters every 15 minutes. So that if somebody uses the restroom or uses their kitchen or whatever, if they're using our wastewater system, we can catch them and we'll have fewer gaps. When we initially started, we were just taking grab samples because we did not have a lot of these auto samplers. They're kind of pricey, they're five or $6,000. And with the grant, we've now purchased over 20 of them and distributed them throughout the state to all these different cities, Ludding, Ping, Bray, Ray, um, Cadillac, everywhere, Reed City. So now we've added to the, to the repertoire of these wastewater plants at diverse sites, including Paris. We now have more auto samplers where we can get these composite samples that could be useful not only for detecting COVID, but you can detect other things. You can detect um, pharmaceuticals, you can detect other infectious agents like bacteria or other viruses, pollutants, um, chemotherapeutics like antibiotics being shed into the wastewater or endocrine disrupting chemicals. You, there's a host of things you can do with these auto samples. So we've, fundamentally increase the abilities, capabilities of these labs across our region. So we've gathered samples from various cities and also from around Paris because, well, from our perspective, we wanted to know, can we track on campus where there's a problem because, well, we're not a monolithic group here. We've got students in North Hall, North Hall. We've got students on South Quad. We've got students all over. If we can localize, oh, there's a problem over here, maybe this dorm, it's hard to get to even that ground one. Then we could send messaging to those students and put um, resources toward those students to go to where the problem is rather than just treating everybody the same. So we've had a bunch of sample sites, a bunch of manholes that have been highlighted on this map. So they're all over the place. So Right now, let's see here, which is which? This is public safety here. So that's pharmacy and yeah, all of the graduate programs over here. So all of these dorms are being captured by these manholes. Over here, we've got, there's North Hall. Here's science, arts and science, star and theater. All of these, are being captured by doo -doo 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 -doo, up here, two. Number two, which is this, that's a two. Used to be a name. <laughs> so this is now a two right here. It captures from a bunch of places, whereas this manhole captures primarily from North Hall. So we can get signals and we can try to triangulate between the samples. And we can say, well, this one close to North Hall is hot, or this one down here is hotter. And they're not just catching from one building or one room or anything. They're sharing a bit of a network of pipes that's underneath our campus, which is extremely complex and very old, generally. And I don't even know if we have a really accurate map of where even all the pipes are, but- It was pretty good. It was pretty good. They, they could only not find one. Yeah. They, they <laughs> one went missing. Hellacy Hall, they could not find. Yeah. yeah. Until they started the construction, then they found it. <laughs> but like with all these manholes, you could say this one's hot and this one's not, and this one's hot, and you could try to triangulate between them where the potential problem is. So we could, we can't ever say it's all in this dorm or it's all on third floor of this dorm. We can say this part of campus seems to have a problem right now, or it's a growing problem. Our signal is getting stronger, and that's not what we want to see. We want to see the signal going down. So that was the strategy. 
in placement of auto samplers and getting grab samples. From the city of Big Rapids, we went to the wastewater plant, we got it from the headworks, which is down the hill from this. This is an aeration basin. At the headworks, you're looking at this, you're going, ooh, raw sewage, right? Well, actually, most of that's not raw sewage. It's dark, not because of the sewage, it's dark because this is a bacteria farm. They're growing bacteria, and it's really dark because all of the bacteria that are growing in there. When wastewater comes into the wastewater plant, it's actually just a very, very light gray color. There's not big stuff floating in there. The microbes will will be eliminating the virus as it's going through, and the virus is going to aggregate onto material and sediment out during wastewater processing. So at the influence stage is where we capture our samples right out of the raw sewage. At that point, you're basically capturing two townships in all of the city of Big Rapids. And the flow rate into the plant is about a million gallons per day. So they're getting just a small sample of that big flow. And that's all treated and released into the river. So you have to worry it's cleaner than the river by the time they're done. And the river's flow rate is a billion gallons per day. So the people at the wastewater plant and the other participating wastewater plants gather samples each day. They're stored in bottles. People like me go out with university vans and gather these bottles every week and haul them back in coolers to be treated in the Shimatsu lab, largely by our technician and our students. I don't know if you caught it. So Ferris and Big Rapids are sampled two times a week. So we sample on Monday. So it's really Sunday to Monday morning. So it's really the Sunday night. And then we, we grab a sample on Thursday morning. So it's Wednesday to Thursday. Mm -hmm. And then we're picking up all the rest of the city all once a week, and that's on Tuesdays which allows us to, everyone that's worked in labs know you need to time out when you're doing things and whether you have time or not. So. Because it is a long process. <laughs> which we're going to talk about now. Yep. So we bring the wastewater treatment, the wastewater samples to the lab. Um, immediately, we actually have two labs we utilize. So the, the processing of this wastewater occurs in basically three steps. The first step is to take the raw wastewater and isolate the RNA from it. The second step is to take that RNA and convert it into a signal that we can measure the SARS-CoV-2 virus from. And the third step is analyzing that signal. So we're gonna talk about those more in depth. Um, the whole process itself, for the processing I just talked about, is minimum of 10 to 12 hours. Um, we have a team of 12 people, of my technician Cassidy, who's a former student, and then 11 current students, you have to stack in the center, um, 11 students uh, from biochemistry, biotechnology, and biology that are the people that do this. And they are very good at what they do. And I, uh, we could not do this without them. They're really the heroes of this, whole, of this whole process here. So when we first get the wastewater RNA, we take it immediately to a lab up in science building, in the science building. There we're going to have three steps. We're going to concentrate the RNA, precipitate the RNA, and isolate the RNA. So the concentration of the RNA in the wastewater is going to take place in a hood. Um, this one? No, there we go. So it's going to take place in a hood because wastewater can potentially have a lot of other pathogens in it that are not dangerous. Now the SARS-CoV-2 virus is, when it goes to the gut, is inactivated by the gut and not dangerous. But hepatitis, uh, the HIV, others, other viruses could be in the, or other bacteria could be in there that are dangerous. So therefore, this is done in the hood, um, and our students wear protective clothing as well to do this. Uh, we add two chemicals. We add sodium chloride and polyethylene glycol to this, and we stir it in the refrigerator at four degrees Celsius for about two hours, over two hours. Um, as it's stirring, as it's in the, in the refrigerator, the RNA is being concentrated or pulled um, into the polyethylene glycol, the peg we call it. Um, that, that polyethylene glycol 
um, is then precipitated in the next step. So to precipitate it, so after we take it out of the fridge for those two hours of stirring, we put it in a centrifuge, a refrigerated centrifuge, and we spin it fast for about an hour and a half. That polyethylene glycol with the RNA in it is precipitated down to the bottom of that tube into a pellet. And then that, that we can take now take that pellet, which you have to be very careful to isolate that pellet because it's kind of a soft gelatinous type pellet. Think of soft jello trying to get it out of a tube a glass and trying not to disturb the pellet of soft jello on the bottom of the glass where you take the water off the top. That's what we're dealing with. Um, we're going to take that pellet, we're going to use that to use a chitin RNA kit, a viral RNA kit. We're going to isolate the RNA from that pellet. Now, the RNA in that pellet is not just the SARS-CoV-2 RNA, it's all the RNA. So it's going to have human RNA, it's going to have bacterial RNA. RNA. You got people dumping pet litter or pet stuff down the toilet, you're going to have animal RNA. So it's all different types of RNA. This process alone, um, it's going to take between five and seven hours. And I should point out here, Heather and, and Myrie here are working in the lab here um, doing each of these steps. Most of these students will know how to do each step in this process by the time they're done. This is a five to seven hour process. So again, this is half day. These, these, these students are playing, you know, they're playing tag. They're, they're playing a relay where they have to pass the baton to each other to get this stuff accomplished in a day. And Cassidy in the center there, she oversees it, makes sure things are going well. Let's go to the next step. So we, now we've got the RNA, we've got the total RNA, what we're gonna do with it. Well, we need to make, um, we need to get ready for the digital droplet PCR reaction. Now, many of you have probably heard about the PCR reaction from the clinical test. It's the most reliable way to test for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the COVID-19 virus. The COVID-19 virus, that there's tested for the PCR test is the same virus we're looking for here. And it's basically the same type of technology. We just use a little bit better technology than what they do in the clinical labs. Because this is a brand new process. The digital droplet PCR or DD PCR is a brand new process. Only it's less than 10 years old. And what we're gonna do in this process is we're gonna take a normal small 20 microliter reaction and we're gonna divide it up in between 10,000 and 25,000 droplets and measure each of those droplets individually. And that's gonna give us an increased sensitivity. We can now detect the virus at a much lower level in the sewer, like one part in quadrillion or quintillion other parts. Um, and it's also gonna give us a little bit less problem with inhibition in these reactions. As you can imagine, wastewater probably has a lot of inhibitory compounds in it that would probably be a problem with anything. Well, it's a problem with the PCR. So we're, we're eliminating some of the problems with this by using this DD PCR. So the steps in doing that, this is actually a, not just one instrument, it's multiple instruments. It takes up two big tables on the back of my lab. Um, so we're gonna kind of go through the process. So the first step we have Juliana and Joel, Joey here, they're making the, the test, the PCR reaction plate. These are 96 well plates, so each plate has 96 wells in it. And they have to put several reagents in each well, including the isolated RNA, to be able for the reaction to go forward once we put it in the instrument. So they have to be very precise about this. And in fact, if they're not precise enough, we will catch it and we'll skew our data and then I have to make the plate again. And we don't want to do that because we are very much in a time crunch to get everything done. Um, we're doing 44 samples a week, and we do, plus the variants. We have to do variant testing. That's an additional testing. And so if we have to remake a plate, that's a problem. We also have some other test uh, control plates we have to run as well for this whole process. So we're making a lot of plates. We're probably doing over 50 to 60 plates a week normally every week, 96 whole plates. So they make their plates. Now they're going to put it over here in this, uh, this little automated droplet generator thing. This is a robot. And it basically is gonna take those little reactions in each of the 96 wells of their plate that they've got. And it's gonna suck it up, gonna put it, mix it in oil, and it's gonna make between 10,000 and 25,000 droplets. And it's gonna put that in, then into a new plate, which we're gonna seal and then put into the heart of any PCR reaction, the thermocycler. Uh, uh, if those of you that are scientists, maybe you've heard, seen the, the BioRad song where they, they're actually hugging the thermocycler to them. 
Um, and, well, and scientists would get it. I mean, we love it. So, um, so, so this step here is the guts of the PCR reaction. This is what it's going to take. This is the copy machine for the DNA or the RNA that's there. They can take one piece of, theoretically, take one piece of RNA and convert it into a billion, a trillion, quadrillion, multiple pieces of RNA or DNA, actually. So that we're able to see it now in our reader that comes next. So this this alone right here, this is about a two to three hour reaction in the, in the thermal cycler. We then take the plate from the thermal cycler and we put it in the reader here to read the number of positive droplets. This whole process also takes about six hours. So now we're about 12 hours into this process, and we're just getting to the point now where we can analyze the data. So here we are. Here's Juliana again. She's getting set to analyze the data. Here's her screen. Um, there's multiple parameters we can look at on the screen for this, but we're only going to concentrate on a couple right here. The first one is we need to make sure we have 10,000, at least 10,000 droplets in each well. If we don't have 10,000 droplets, we're not sure that our data is accurate. We have to have at least 10,000 droplets. Um, and then the second thing we do is something called threshold. So each of those droplets, each of those droplets are going to be read in the reader. It's going to go, each droplet's going to go past a little laser. Oops, past my laser here. Sorry. So it's going to go past the laser, it's going to shine out. Literally, it's a laser. And it's going to see if that drop will reference. Sorry about that, Beth. Okay, that's TV. Um, so it's going, to, and it's going to determine if there is a SARS-CoV-2 signal in there, fluorescent signal in each droplet. Now, those droplets are going to be arranged according to those that have signal and those that don't have signal. Those that don't have signal don't have the SARS-CoV-2. If they do have signal, they have SARS-CoV-2 in it. Each of these little um, spots here, points, is a single droplet. If you have... The black down here and the black down here are the droplets that have no SARS-CoV-2. There was no signal, signal for SARS-CoV-2, only the droplet. The blue up here and the green down here, those are the droplets that were positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And we can go through and we can quantitate these numbers here um, of the positive droplets that are here. The top wells up here, the top graphic, this is the N1 region of the N gene that we're targeting. And then this bottom one is the N2 region of the uh, N gene that we're targeting. You're probably wondering, what is that peak line? Well, the machine doesn't automatically draw the line between the positive and the negative droplets. So we have to go in and do that manually in a process, process called thresholding. And this thresholding, it is pretty easy for the N1 gene up here. The N2 gene can test us a little bit and our ability to draw lines. Um, you would have think we would have learned that in kindergarten, but we sometimes have troubles with that. So um, this is gonna give us the raw data, these figures here. We're gonna put that out in Excel spreadsheet and all this together, we've taken about an hour, maybe an hour and a half to get this done. So we're up 12, 13 hours. And from this one, we're going to go to the next one, um, and we're going to report the data. So this data, we get that we get to this we get this Excel uh, spreadsheet of the raw data. Then we have another Excel spreadsheet that MSU made for us. We take all the raw data with some of the controls that we've done. We put this into this new Excel spreadsheet, and it spits out it spits out all this, these numbers here that you see for us. And that tells us the amount of SARS-CoV-2 that's present in 100 mils of wastewater. Um, we report this data within 24 hours, if everything goes right, to the state of Michigan. And we're going to look at that website just in a second here. So we report the state of Michigan to Michigan DHHS and Michigan Eagle. Uh, we also could be completely surveyed for Michigan DHHS we do every week. All this data goes onto the Michigan team site. Um, it also goes to District Health Department number 10 and Central Michigan District Health Department for 
that was only for uh, Lee City. We reported all the different city officials were taking that we report to with the wastewater samples from. And we also take it for the COVID testing task force here on campus. Now, <clears throat> this is what we actually give to the testing, the COVID testing task force. And as you can see there, it's color coded. There are white spots, there are yellow places, there are orange places, and then there are red places. The white is a little concern. The yellow, we're starting to get concerned a little bit. The orange, we're starting to pay attention. The red, we're like, oh no, we gotta send out signals. We got, we got to send out communications that there's a possibility that there could be COVID in this dorm or this area. Um, right here, this is Miller dorm. So we'd expect our isolation dorm, we'd expect that to be high and it was a lot of time. Um, and you can see that any particular building had times when they were red throughout the, throughout the fall semester here that we're showing. Um, what we can do then is we can track um, whether things are going up, the SARS-CoV-2 signal is going up in a building or an area, a wastewater shed, or it's going down. If it's going up and continuing up, we know we got a problem. If it's going down below, you know, into the down from the orange to the yellow to the white to zero, we've got a good, we, have, we know we've got a good thing. I can tell you, you heard it first today, our samples from yesterday, every single one of these sites had a reading of zero. <laughs> <laughs> every single site had a reading of zero. So hopefully we're over this Omicron wave of COVID for right now. So um, the other thing I didn't mention about this is that we, this is just the first step. If we get if we get any of these um, from any particular location, Ferris or Big Rapids or any of the other cities, we will take a sample that's over 10,000 and we will test for variants, whether we have Delta, Alpha, Beta, Epsilon, or Omicron. Actually, we can't test well for Omicron yet. The, test, the, the kit just came out this week. <laughs> so um, perfect timing, I guess. So um, we had ways to, to guesstimate. There were ways like to we say predominantly or totally yes. there, there was a way using the other kit that it looked like we could potentially say it definitely looks like it's probably Omicron, but we really could say <laughs> it's definitely, <laughs> probably. Right. definitely probably. <laughs> That's about how we look at it. Yeah. So yeah. the state figures that in the US figures right now that most everything in the US is Omicron. So all right, so let's go to the next one. So the other thing that we we report to that first one, we'll report to the state of Michigan. This goes to the state of Michigan website and they're gonna make a, um, this report right here. You can pull this up using this kind of URL or the URL here. Um, you can pick any of the 400 sites that's on this list. Right here, we have uh, East Campus Suites of Fair State University. Um, it shows where we're at in the map, in case we didn't know. <laughs> Um, it tells us what percentage of the samples from this site were grab samples, like, like Cliff talked about, versus auto sample, auto sample, um, composite samples. And it also tells us what type of, uh, what we use, something called QPCR or digital copy PCR. We can then look at the, the signal, the ups and downs as it went through the semester, through the year. Unfortunately, they have not updated this past January 30th of this year. Um, recently, the CDC has taken a lot of interest in wastewater testing. And so all the computer people that made this have been swamped trying to get themselves aligned for the CDC wants. And so they have not been able to update this since January 30th. Um, I think we'll just skip looking at this on yeah. the line. Let me point out, like the top, so this is the main page. If you can't find it and wanna know, just ask one of us so we can direct you. But the top one there in the blue, is the one that goes where you can see our data. And then the Sentinel tweet is just it's the highlighted local areas of the state that are based on population that's going to the CDC. So they don't want all the data. So. Um, something I should add here, on this particular graph, you can see a light gray line on the bottom. That's the lower limit detection for that particular day um, that the digital PCR gives. Um, the gray line, Gray line here is the N1 and the black line is the N2. So you can you want the N1 and N2 to be similar and you can see they're, they're pretty much the same on top of each other. So that's a good sign. <clears throat> there is one additional box down here we can't see. 
It has a number of samples that were tested up to January 30th and a number that were positive. So if you wanted to do some exploring of, of what's happened here at Ferris or in, the, in this region, um, you can do that or any other site in the state of Michigan. You can check out your own hometown if you want. So, and I believe that is it for that slide. Oh, one more. Okay, so this is really talking about where does wastewater fit in the whole scheme of dealing with COVID. Now, we all have experienced this, uh, the top lines up here where we have an individual test. We get the antigen test, so we get the qPCR test. They stick the, the swab up our nose, and then they, they run a qPCR test, so they do the antigen test, so we do it at home. If we're positive, well, then we have to isolate or quarantine for a while. Um, we report that to the authorities. They do some tracking, and then um, they basically call us when we can go back to society. The same thing is not true for the, 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 the wastewater testing. In the wastewater testing, we're actually looking at as just a population and we're looking at it as an early warning detection event. This then can provide a tool for public health officials to go ahead and um, warn people that may be in areas where the so the increase is going up. You know, we can't tell individuals that are affected here, but we can tell something's increasing, something's really high and staying high. We can tell that. If that's happening, like we saw, well, like what we did here at Ferris, now we can give them the people that in that area, we can tell them, you know, get tested, get vaccinated, um, uh, do the, the targeted clinical testing, uh, just make send out awareness messages to do that. We did that. That's the worst storm we had on campus actually this year was North Hall. So we had to do that several times with North Hall. And so a tool, this is a brand new tool. Wastewater is a brand new tool in public health. Um, it is, like I said, it's being noticed by the CDC. And you're only gonna, we're going, only gonna see more of this and Ferris has been in the breaking edge, groundbreaking work of this and with the rest of the state of Michigan. This is the safety net on the way out of COVID because Sweden has totally dropped all of the restrictions for COVID. Yesterday, England dropped all of their restrictions. Sooner or later, we're gonna drop our guard. But when we keep doing this, this is the safety net. If there's something that's re-emerging, we'll catch it and can backtrack before things get out of control. Excuse me. I think so. Yeah, so the purpose really is to act as that safety net to inform so that we can remove the onus of all of the testing at the individual level because it's, it's difficult to get compliant, it's expensive, it's cumbersome, it's not sustainable in the long run. We've done it because we've had to, but as we move out of this and we enter into the endemic stage of COVID, because it's not going away, guys. COVID can affect just about any mammal. It's in our dog, it's in our cat. It's gonna be in mice and rats. It's gonna be everywhere. It's not going to go away. It's not going to kill as much. It's probably going to attenuate, but we have to keep our guard up. And this is a way that the government can let up, but still maintain surveillance so that they do their due diligence. The limitations, basically, as we talked about before, we can't get granular to the point of people because the different variant, Delta sheds differently than Omicron sheds, which is different than Alpha. And the next variant, Pi or Rho or whatever it is, the Omega variant, they're all gonna shed differently and different people shed different numbers of viruses. So we can't necessarily quantitate to a person, but we can get to a community. And also you can shed for months after you are well, because your immune system is keeping it in check and you feel well, but the virus could still be there. You could still be shedding for quite some time. That doesn't necessarily mean you were infectious, but it is detectable. 
So our responses have been the three questions, right? So if you got that thing from the state, the main thing that we can do is try to inform people to, to, to stay away from people, to go get tested. And so there's been tons of increased messaging to students. Sometimes it's targeted directly to dorms. We've even moved the testing clinic when students weren't actually going and getting tested. The testing clinic moved the dorm and they moved right into North Hall. And so as people came by, they said, oh, maybe you should get tested. <laughs> and that was a way that actually students got tested and then we could isolate those people that were positive, do the contact tracing and quarantine those that had to be quarantined. Um, we also had increased hours when they were high. Um, and then whenever people were going out or coming to campus, um, we were really highly encouraging people to get tested. So our, um, this Michigan network was, uh, we call it MyNet, the Network for Environment and Technology and Activities, it's not just wastewater, it's also with the um, Beach Water Consortium, so looking at E. coli across beaches. Um, so it's a big network. Uh, we meet every Wednesday um, on Zoom. So it's a big group. We talk about struggles that we're having, what we're finding, how we do about Omicron, what we can do. Um, it's all being, um, we don't really have, we didn't talk about Zoom, yep, Rose Lab. So the Rose Lab is really, MSU is really taking the lead. Um, and they've been the ones that have set down the guidelines of the protocols that we're using. So everyone is using the same protocols across the state. Um, and we had a nice meeting up uh, in October where we met in person um, and shared everything. And it was really nice to see everybody in person as opposed to, to Zoom. And then there were a couple of other things you guys wanted to mention these two. Well, there's a manuscript in preparation right now that the whole MyNet group is working on describing the formation of MyNet, which sounds like Skynet, <laughs> but it's better than Skynet. Um, MyNet formation, because this is a unique thing in the world, really. There have been cases where like a city or a county has set up a surveillance process and they'll do surveillance for like COVID in their wastewater. But there were no other statewide initiatives of this scope involving so many different labs coordinating and standardizing the procedures and the data collection as Michigan. And we're actually basically a model for the CDC. And a lot of what the CDC is trying to do is built upon the ideas that were developed in mind that for writing a paper to kind of publish and document how this came about, this whole consortium and what kind of initial findings it generated. The states are starting to bother our state <laughs> for information. And then the, <clears throat> just recently we got a proposal from CMU um, to Ferris and S the Saginaw Valley that we would start looking at how the in rural university communities, how wastewater vaccines and COVID-19 are, are correlated with each other. So that's something brand new. By the way, I wanted to mention that Dr. Zimmer, Beth Zimmer here, is the one that came up with the acronym MyNet and the <laughs> meaning of it. So she wouldn't pat herself on the back, but we'll do it for her. Go to the, we're gonna skip through the summary. Yep. We, really, yeah. we really should spend just one minute at least. Yeah. Talk, talking about who and what we're doing. So there are tons and tons of people. We have two slides. Um, the biggest thing for us is the core lab. So this is their new artwork. <laughs> I said, you guys have to go put your names. So that, that we have their names on their artwork. Um, so those students are really doing the work. Um, all the resources that we have with the state and the um, Michigan State. Um, and then the next slide would be all of the other people that are working on this. And it's not even inclusive of everybody. So even at every city, you have the plumbers and the wastewater treatment people, the city officials that we work because we give them money. So Trisha, the office is helping us do all the money stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just goes on and on with a whole bunch of people that have been involved. So. You, you can probably double the size of this list and you yeah. still may not be enough people involved yeah. in this. You fill the whole slide. Yeah. The Cecil B. DeMille. Yeah. Cast <laughs> Now we're done. So we're done. <laughs> <laughs> You said that you really had to hustle because uh, you know within four days you guys were up and running. So this was uh, 
equipment that was already on hand? So we were able to start with the, the instrument in the lab called QPCR, the digital droplet PCR the state actually bought for us um, with some of that $10 million of the pilot project grant. Um, and we got that, we started using that the first of November, 2020. But in the initial week, we were just grabbing stuff like out of my research lab and your research yeah. lab, and we just kind of cobbled it together with, with duct tape and bailing wax. Yeah. We cleaned out a lab of other people's stuff. I thought, oh, it's all in boxes. <laughs> and we shoved everybody else's stuff away. And yeah, it was crazy. I did that on the weekend so that we could start preparing the next day on Monday. Yeah, it was bad. We need to transition till the next. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Nice little thing is in there. Here's the biggest thing. That one. Yep. Yep. Good job. Great job. It's got a great job. Thank you. Good to see you again. Good job. It is. Hi, I'm Ellie. I just wanted to introduce myself. Hi, is it actually me? Who is it? 